this week on Forward. They have this terrible accountability trap where they're they're judged by following the rules, but when following the rules doesn't get you the outcomes, then they, you know, everyone's mad about the, about the outcomes. But we've yes. got to remove that accountability trap, and we need philosophy of our government that's about removing those barriers, not just about passing new legislation. I, I think a lot of techies would happily join if they uh, could be onboarded quickly and utilized effectively. Once tech people get a taste of doing tech in government and, and design people and, and people not inside tech, most of the time they're hooked because the impact is so huge. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome to the podcast the founder and CEO of Code for America for a decade, the former deputy CTO of the United States of America, and the author of this phenomenal new book, Recoding America, Why Government is Failing in the Digital Age and How We Can Do Better, Jennifer Palka. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Andrew. I've got to correct you from the start, though. Um, I have not been the CEO of Code for America for three years, uh, but I did found it, so I've passed the baton to a wonderful leader. Uh, I know the feeling. Uh, so uh, describe for people what Code for America is, um, which is, is an organization I admired from the get-go. So we started out with this notion that some of the principles and practices of what we then called Web 2.0, the participatory web, the lightweight user-centered web, um, could help government. And we started by helping city governments. And uh, now, what is it, 12 years later, we're working a lot with states and some of the federal government and really just trying to make government services work for people the way that they should. And we've, we've uh, the organization's had a, a lot of impact. I'm really proud of the work that they do. Yeah, so I, I started Venture for America around the same time, and I have to say I admired and envied uh, Code for America because what you all did was recruit technologists and designers uh, and folks who wanted to make government work better to actually work with state and local governments around the country. How many people did you wind up enlisting uh, over the, gosh, now 13 years? Yeah, I mean, our first year we had 20 fellows. Um and then, you know, that went up and down over the years. But sort of a couple of years in, we realized that the fellows model um, had a lot to offer, but that to sustain this work, we really needed to have a large full-time staff. And uh, that's where we are today. And instead of just doing a year-long fellowship with people, though it has been fantastic getting tech talent interested in government, and we've come so so far on that. Um, you know, now the organization is about 200 people full time, not, you know, not taking just a fellowship year, but, you know, working over many years with governments on things like automatic records clearance or um, making government services like SNAP and Medicaid much, much easier to access. And so it's been hundreds of people now, um, but through lots of different mechanisms. Yeah, and then you wound up in the mothership itself uh, in Washington, yeah. D.C., in the giant office across the street, though connected to the White House as deputy CTO. Uh, how was your experience in D.C.? And what I love about your track record, Jennifer, is that you, you essentially walk the walk like no one else did. Uh, like I, you and I know dozens of people in Silicon Valley who are like, eh, why doesn't government just work better? But most of them, as you detail in your book, um, haven't really invested their own energies in trying to make <laughs> government work better. They just have sort of taken for granted that government bad at tech, um, tech companies good at tech, and that's just the way of the world. And you said, wait a minute, there's so mm -hmm. much impact to be had in the public sector if you could improve these services. As a matter of fact, you would touch millions more Americans in ways that are fundamental, like how they get their uh, their veterans benefits, how they get their, their food stamps. And so uh, you went straight to the source uh, in DC as the deputy CTO, you worked with the CTO. You described that there was something of a dark time in, uh, in the technology leadership of the country because there was no CTO until Obama arrived on the scene. Um, I, I actually met with the first CTO um, in DC when I was running Venture for America. Um, and then you worked with, I want to say, the second or third, Todd Park. Um, yep, he was the second. 
Yeah, the second. So, and and I've met Todd, and he's a powerhouse and awesome. Mm-hmm. And it seems like he did some really good persuading to get you to to join him in D.C. Yeah, he did. Um, it was funny. You're, you're absolutely right. There's something you get out of working on the inside that you just don't get um, trying to help from the outside. As much as I, I do value people trying to help government from the outside, and many, many people do, when, when Todd asked me to come, it was very impractical for me. Code for America was just a few years old, and I was very dedicated to it. I also had a kid, lived on the West Coast. Um, ultimately, you know, I felt like I was going to be a bit of a hypocrite if I was encouraging all of these other people to go work in government. And in fact, working side by side with these fellows who were giving a year in government. And then I wouldn't do it myself. Um, <laughs> that was ultimately what, what convinced me, though. I have to say, Todd is by far the best recruiter I think I've ever met in my life. And, and he, he really, really made it uh, sort of uh, impossible for me to say no. But my big regret only is that I couldn't stay longer. I do think that, you know, when people are going into government for a year, they get a taste of it, but the real impact, you know, continues um, over the years. And I have uh, enormous respect for people who go into government and stay. I mean, the hero of the book really is a woman named Yadira Sanchez. She doesn't come in until chapter 10, but um, she's been at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services her whole career. And I think you know, she's an enormous change agent. So I, I'm proud of people like me who came in for a short time, but I'm also really enamored of those public servants who, who give it their all and stay for a really long time and make long-term sustainable change because that is really, really what we need. Now, so you showed up at a pivotal time in uh, American tech history, I suppose, which was a- around the time that healthcare.gov blew up. <laughs> or, yeah. I mean, not blew up, but we all remember. I mean, they, you know, they rolled out Obamacare and then the website collapsed uh, on day one and no one could use it. And then everyone was so mad. Uh, and uh, you were part of the team that was tasked with trying to turn it around in real time. Uh, and the, the lessons from that are really interesting. I, I can't wait to dig into the themes of this book, but just explain to the average American. So the average American thinks to themselves, how the heck can you have such an epic fail <laughs> of, of a website? And meanwhile, the, from, from your explanation, the inner workings, um, a lot of that stuff is actually very predictable and repeats itself in different contexts. It sure does. Um, you know, I, I when the pandemic hit and everyone was surprised that we couldn't deliver unemployment insurance in many states, or at least many people got stuck in backlogs, um, nobody should have been surprised. If you're looking at how these things are built and delivered, how they're maintained, our whole approach to government technology, um, I think it should not have been surprising to anybody. And certainly the lessons of healthcare.gov are applicable there. Um, I didn't really help rescue the site. I was trying to stand up what was called United States Digital Service. It's still around. It's still um, really kicking butt, doing great work. Um, And so um, a bunch of my colleagues and my boss were working on the healthcare.gov rescue. Um, You know, it's really this whole approach that we have to technology uh, in government we believe that there's some way to objectively know all of the possible requirements that need to be fulfilled. And then we try to hand that entire mess over to a vendor and have them just fulfill requirements. But, you know, fulfilling requirements, first of all, is not setting priorities. It's just saying do it all, which very rarely works. Uh, and it's not really requirements are very specific things. They don't always add up to something that actually works. And as my friend and colleague Marina Nitsa says, there's never a requirement that says the thing should work. So (laughs) in the case of healthcare.gov, it was, you know, a big visible, uh, we'll call it a failure, probably a more generous thing to call it would be a rocky start because it did quite well at the end of that open enrollment period. We enrolled more people than we even thought possible before the failure of the site. Um, But with that really rocky start, of course, lots of attention and lots of people upset about things, you know, but you really often have things that don't get that kind of attention, but also still just really don't work because they're built to fit these very specific requirements and not really 
you know, they're not really subject to the scrutiny of does this thing work for the users who are supposed to use it? And we need a really fundamental shift in how we think about and approach this technology if we want to stop having failures like healthcare.gov, like the things that have happened at the VA, like the unemployment insurance backlogs. I mean, we're going to continue to have these unless we have that kind of change. I am so pumped that the last election is coming out September 12th. The political thriller by yours truly and Stephen Marsh, the author of The Next Civil War, will be in stores everywhere. But you can buy your copy right now at andrewyang.com. Order now and be the first on the block to know how the next election turns out. It has all the twists and turns. Will it be the last election? Let's hope not. andrewyang.com for the last election. Buy it today. Thank you. Love you all. Yeah, and it's what most Americans want. I mean, I, I think that your book is so important because it actually diagnoses a set of problems that most Americans have gotten very frustrated by. And then it's fed into an institutional mistrust and even, uh, I think, a loss of faith in various institutions or uh, our our government's ability to get things done and, and evolve. So you mentioned the VA. You had some fascinating stories from the VA. Um, and the, the most compelling thing I think most of us would understand, by the way, I, when I ran for president, I met hundreds of veterans who would uh, tell mm -hmm. me terrible things about what was happening with the VA or not happening, where they'd be like, hey, I've been waiting on hip surgery for four years and I can't get a straight answer. And, you know, it's like really, really depressing, heartbreaking stuff that I would hear every day on the trail. Yeah. Um, so you told the story of a, a veteran named Dominic who uh, tried to submit request for care on the VA form and just couldn't do it. And uh, he, he, he had this video of himself just not being able to do it. And then, then you managed to get this video in front of a senior administrator there who just looked at it and said, okay, this is totally unacceptable. Um, now, the VA form uh, fulfilled its technical requirements. Those technical requirements were kind of bizarre. <laughs> like I, I think it had the using Internet Explorer or something very specific. Uh, and and then when you said, "Look, uh, like we should probably make this form usable for the average veteran," um, and with the the video from uh, from Dominic, the change got made. Then all of a sudden, the users on the form shot up something like tenfold because all of a sudden the form was submittable and usable. And then the folks within the VA were saying, like, change back to the old form because we're not used to this kind of volume. Yeah, it's a very unfortunate response. But uh, the team that worked on this got over that and it really became the impetus for an enormous change that's been going on at the VA now since really since that time, which was 2014. So this has been a trajectory that I think everybody at the VA can be very proud of. It is not that everything's fixed. But that realization that they had to look outside, you know, the walls of the building and see what was actually happening for users, for the veterans who were trying to get benefits, not what it looked like on paper inside the building, has has been um, an enormous transformation. Yeah, in in, in that case, um, uh, again, Marina Nitza um, and her team, Emily Tavalarius and, and Marianne Brody, you know, what they found was that the computers inside the building were set up to use a particular combination of Internet Explorer and Adobe Reader. But it had to be a specific version of each of those, both of them outdated. And if you were, that's what that form had been built to load on. So if you were outside the building, the chances that you had that specific combination of those two pieces of software on your computer was almost zero. So it didn't work for you. But because it worked for everybody inside the building, they could not see the problem. And when they went and looked at the paperwork, the paperwork said the vendor completed all the requirements, the form works fine, there's nothing we can do about this. And that's what they were told, this, this wonderful team, over and over again, until they brought the video of Dominic and put it in front of the deputy secretary and said, you must watch this. And seeing what was actually happening with this guy who is just, you know, a heart of a heartbreaking narrator of, of this and very funny, very kind. And of course, you know, 
a bit sharp tongued because he he really was getting screwed. Um, that's when everything changed, and and it's been it's been so lovely to see the VA get better and better every year. You you mentioned before the unemployment benefits. You were actually brought in to help California. Uh, during its COVID response. Um, and, and you told this very interesting story. So you're there trying to speed up the response. There's a backlog of claims. And then the uh, public officials very um, proudly said, look, we, we're hiring hundreds of new people to process claims. Um, but because of the esoteric nature of the way the, that claims were processed, a new person didn't actually have the ability to help process claims immediately because it, it's a pretty arcane process. There was a joke saying that maybe it takes 17 years to become somewhat expert in the process or so having a new hire may or may not do the trick. And so what was happening was that experienced hires, instead of clearing the backlog, were training new hires and actually slowing the pace down. Um, and so y- you were trying to make the case to folks, look, hey, guys, uh, like this isn't a hiring thing, <laughs> like, like getting more people um, actually isn't solving this particular um, immediate bottleneck, uh, you know, solving the bottleneck would look a little different. And you had a quote that I thought was maybe the most accurate thing ever, which is that, and let's see if I can read this to get it right. It was, when a system fails to deliver, it's not that the people within it are stupid or evil. It's that there are incentives in play that are not evident from the outside of that system. And I, I thought that was the best explanation I had seen for why so many of these things that seem irrational from the outside are perfectly rational to those on the inside. A hundred percent. I think I wrote the book in part because I've been doing this work now for 13 years and I encounter so many folks who are upset about government in general, upset about government service delivery. And it's easy to ascribe sort of, you know, um, negative intentions or incompetence to the people doing it. And that is so rarely what I've been found, you know, what I found working inside the old adage, you know, it's the system, not the people is really, really, really true. You, you, you called it a joke, you know, that this guy had been here 17 years and was still new. It wasn't a joke, Andrew. Like he was literally saying that the system that they use to deliver benefits to the people of California is so complicated, so abstruse, so complex that 17 years of working there, he still felt like he was learning it. And he said, the folks who actually know how this work have been here 25 years or more. And that's another reason I wrote the book was that it's so easy to look at the technology that government uses to deliver these systems and say, oh, that's bad. They must have bad programmers. They must hire bad companies. But when you really peel back the layers and look what's going on there, it would be very hard for technology to be delivering that well. There's a lot to say about how government builds and buys technology. That whole requirements issue is a big part of it, and there are many others. But when you look at something like unemployment insurance, there are layers of technology that go back to the 80s, and we've had sort of a new layer of technology added every decade, essentially, since then. Yeah, yeah, you described it as archaeology. I thought of it as like rings in a tree. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. Um, But it's, you know, these things have just sort of been left there and then they try to add on to it, but there's not a lot of backwards compatibility that happens and you sort of create new systems instead of refreshing the old one. And that is a problem. I give it, uh, you know, I give you that. And that's what we as, as citizens see. But think about unemployment insurance. There are layers of accumulated policy that in that case go back to the 1935 Social Security Act. And nobody ever looks at the backward compatibility of the policy and process that's accrued. And, you know, really, when I when I saw that and I heard this guy say, you know, I'm still learning after 17 years because it's so complicated. I really thought about the way that these policies come down in sort of a memo changing the old one and another memo changing that one. And this came from the executive branch. That came from the judicial branch. This came from the federal DOL. That came from the state legislature it kind of falls and just sits there and has to be, you know, learned for so, so many years that it is impossible to deliver these services, not just because the technology hasn't been built well, but because the people who create our laws and policies 
our elected leaders always add and they never subtract. And there's very little attempt made to go back and sort of rationalize and simplify those 90 some, you know, it's almost 90 years of policy accumulation and cruft in unemployment insurance. And that's true everywhere. So yep. I, called, I called it recoding America, you know, because it's not the code that matters. It's like the the legal code that runs yep. America is sits underneath that. And that we need to look at if we're going to have the computer code work. This podcast is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like not paying attention to the safety demonstration on a flight. Most of the time, you'll probably be fine. But what if one day that weird yellow mask drops down from overhead and you have no idea what to do? It's better to be safe than sorry. That's why I recommend using ExpressVPN, the network that's used by high-end corporations for their remote workers so that everything they do is hacker-proof, anonymous, and verified. I like ExpressVPN because it's easy to use, one click and you're done, and you can access content that you might not be able to see otherwise from Europe on Netflix and other providers. Secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash yang. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash yang. And you can get an extra three months free. expressvpn.com slash yang. Yeah, and so you had so many important ideas in this book. Uh, one is that the mechanical or implementation is thought yes. of as being kind of subordinate uh, or lesser than the yeah. policy making apparatus. And you think about the folks in DC, what is it? It's a think tank. It's like, hey, like we should be doing this policy. We should be doing that policy. Yeah. And then uh, actually delivering that policy to the American people is thought of as like, oh, no, that's someone else's problem. It's like not not a big deal or, it, you know, it, it, it's for the lessers <laughs> to, to, to figure out delivery. Yeah. And then, but you said, look, for most Americans, the delivery is the policy or the website is the policy. It is. That's, I mean, do, has any of us read the tax code lately? No, but we pay our taxes and that is how we experience the tax code. It's this, you know, it's also true of people getting social benefits like SNAP. Um, you don't, go read the eligibility rules. You don't go, you know, read the... You apply for SNAP. <laughs> you apply and you, that's how you find out. And I think that's true of so many things. But that's the delivery apparatus, the people who do delivery is not valued. It's considered sort of, yeah, I mean, I hate to say it, but second-class work in government. And so... And it's not just that it's second class work and sort of there's not attention paid to it. We actually pour enormous resources into it. I think what it is is that we try to pretend that there's no judgment required in it. It's just something that people can take orders to do. They're going to do exactly what somebody above them has said to do, and they should not um, express any creativity or judgment or create priorities. That's why I, yeah, I hear from teams all the any, time. Anyone who knows, like, uh, if you design even, like, a basic web page, you have to make a dozen judgments. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a hundred yeah. judgments, not, not even a dozen. And what are those judgments supposed to be made on? They're supposed to be made by what is going to work for the person who's going to use the website. But we try to take the person who's going to use the website and out of it. What, yeah. what we tell people who do delivery in government to look at is, a whole big set of requirements that have come down from inside the bureaucracy. That's why we talk about meeting government needs instead of meeting user needs. Now, I know we're going to need to meet government needs, but it's about what comes first. The user needs need to come first, and then we fit in you know, meeting some of these compliance requirements, all these government needs. But that's the part of the shift that needs to happen if we're going to have these things work. Yeah, you coined something called Burns Law, which I found endlessly entertaining, but also I'm sure totally <laughs> accurate, which was that most of these government projects could be done for 10% of the cost with 85% of the utility. Uh, yep. And and uh, a lot of the frustration a lot of Americans have is that, like you said, we actually pour tremendous resources into these things. We're like dumping hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes billions of dollars. You quote one state IT director who was talking about this mega project, and you said, I don't think that mega project's going to 
uh, succeed because of the way they were designing it. And she was like, you think that's new to, news to me? The last seven big IT projects in the state have all failed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like success would be actually yeah. unusual in large part because uh, they have this waterfall requirements first process where they kick off by saying, okay, what does this thing need to do? And then they have years and years of, uh, of in some cases, uh, like a bake-off where they determine which mega vendor is going to, to supply this. Meanwhile, the way most of us would do things in business would be, okay, uh, let's try and get something that fulfills some proportion of our needs out um, pretty quickly at, let's say, 10% of the cost. And uh, then you would iterate because you would see after you launch it, you're like, oh, this thing doesn't work. This thing does work. We didn't anticipate that. Um, and then you wind up uh, tweaking and calibrating. So the, the contrast really is between what's considered mm -hmm. the waterfall uh, design process, which is what it seems most government contracts uh, use versus agile software development, which frankly... When most people now read about agile software development, at least for me, I just think that's just what the process is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, maybe it's just because of the people I hang out with. Um, but for lay people, could you help? Um, I, I suppose I, I just gave it my best, but could you help uh, distinguish between those two approaches to product development? Yeah. So, you know, wa waterfall software development is basically the idea that you're going to have these stages uh, you're going to develop requirements, you're going to do a design, you're going to do a build, you're going to do test. And at each of those stages, you don't go back. They happen sequentially and, and there, there's no going back. So like when you've developed requirements, you don't, you don't return to them later. They're locked in. Even if the thing takes 14 years, so you may have locked them in 10 years ago, you still have to deliver on those requirements. Um, which is not how the world works. Uh, it certainly doesn't work that way in government where you have laws changing, you have guidance changing, you have um, different, you know, all these things are changing all the time. In contrast, agile software development says the thing that matters most is not that process. It's, it's understanding the needs of your users and iteratively meeting them. And that means your requirements are absolutely going to change because you're going to learn. <laughs> you're going to learn what your people, you know, can use, what works for them, uh, and it accepts that we live in a world that changes quickly today. You know, my, my point in the book is that it's really for me, I mean, I come from the software world, not technical, but, you know, I've spent my time in the software world. And so it's a metaphor that works for me, but it is a metaphor because that idea of, a, of the waterfall in which, you know, this, the thing that happens third always happens third and you never go back up. The waterfall. That's the, the key thing about waterfall is that the water only flows one way. It's from, you know, the, the powerful people who make decisions to the low level people who implement and don't get a voice in it. And, and Agile says, you know, we actually need to be hearing from those people. It's more like a loop. So you're going to, you know, try this thing and then you um, try it with users. You learn. It's a build, measure, learn cycle. But it's a metaphor for how government works and government yep. culture, yep. where the people who are actually doing the work on the ground, they can't go back to Congress and say, hey, I know you wanted us to do X, but really, if we do it that way, we're going to have all these perverse effects. So how about we do this instead? And Congress goes, oh, sure, like do that. That just doesn't happen because it's a waterfall. But we could think differently about it. We could say, actually, part of the way our government needs to work is to listen to the people doing the implementation. And by the way, that means listening to the people that they're working with, which are our users, which means the American public, which is like what we were founded on, a government for and by and of the people. I mean, agile software development is patriotic, agile culture, agile you know, government itself is patriotic, is, is, you know, very, I think, deeply rooted in the ideas of America. But we've got to change not the software development. I mean, sure, the software development, but we've got to change fundamentally how people in the system behave, probably starting at the top with legislators and other elected leaders saying, I have to care as much about the implementation and the impact of my laws that I sponsor or vote for 
as I do about the actual words that get written on a page and get passed through this, you know, legislative process. But, you know, I go and visit legislators and they are not thinking that way yet, or very, very few of them are. And I think that's the that's going to be the job of the American public here is to re-educate our leaders about what we want. Do we want words on a page or do we want the actual impact of those laws? Well, then we need to hold our, our elected leaders accountable in some very different ways. Hey, YouTube, glad you're enjoying the podcast. If you really like it, hit subscribe, and then YouTube will notify you every time we have a bang up new guest. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is the dream. That is the vision, uh, Jennifer, where you have a dashboard on the walls of Congress and it doesn't have whatever policy words, it has outcomes. <laughs> it has like, hey, like, you know, the kids learning, like people getting food, uh, health outcomes getting better or worse, uh, you know, like, like ver various things that you could actually hold yourself accountable to. Uh, and, and that's the fundamental disconnect right now. Like you said, it's like, look, um, I, I'm going to argue my policy, you're going to argue your policy, and then none of us have to actually follow up to see whether <laughs> whether, whether uh, the reality on the ground changed. Unfortunately, for a lot of Americans, they feel that distance, uh, and they feel this top-down nature of government, and it's making people increasingly frustrated. Um, one of the fascinating elements that you put uh, toward the back of the book was that um, there was an Oracle executive who then writes a letter saying, look, 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 Government should not be in the tech business. <laughs> you, know, like, like, <laughs> like you, 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 you should not have technologists making these kinds of evaluations. You should just stick to procurement. That's what you're good at. Now, uh, coincidentally, um, uh, Oracle happens to sell a lot of uh, software to the, go <laughs> the, 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 the government. And there was one story that really rang true for me which is that you were talking to a tech friend of yours who was negotiating Oracle contracts and Oracle quoted him 17 million and he said 1 million. And then uh, you said, where did it wind up? And he said, 1.5, <laughs> pretty, pretty <laughs> close. Um, but you can very easily imagine a government saying, what, this thing costs 17 million, it's Oracle? And be like, I guess that's what it costs. Maybe we'll get a great deal and get it down to 16. And uh, that would be one of the many benefits of actually integrating technologies into the process where they'd be able to um, get better value for the government. Yeah. I mean, my, my friend happens to be highly technical and a very good negotiator, but almost none of those negotiations end up where it did with my friend. I mean, uh, that company gets a, a, a lot of money um, because there's this huge as as asymmetry in the in the technical know how between the vendors and the and and government folks, and that's you know that's an own goal, as they say. Like we could just decide that their technical talent and uh, leadership in government is a high priority, and that we need you know more people who actually understand the technology than the people you know negotiating the con you know who understand just the really really complicated procurement rules. We need to probably make our procurement rules a little bit less complex, but that's a whole other story. Um, yeah, this is a choice we make um, to, you know, to shoot ourselves in the foot when it comes to government service delivery. And um, the, you know, I, I don't really blame Oracle. They're a profit-driven company, and they're going to do what they think is going to get them the most profit. But I do blame those of us who say, oh, let's believe Oracle's story, because it's not the right narrative. The, the right narrative is we can do this well. Um, the highest and best use of technical talent in our country is in government, making government work better, not just service delivery, but think about things like, you know, the CDC needs, you know, uh, needs people to do work on the data structures that make it so far hard for our states and municipalities to share data with the federal government in a pandemic. You know, that's, you know, is that like a SNAP application? No, but it's an incredibly important piece of work that the best talent in our country should be focused on because we, you know, we know we're going to have these these crises again and we need to be better prepared.
Yeah, I mean, you, you can touch a lot of people's lives. You you improve that SNAP form. I mean, what was the percentage of Californians who were eligible who weren't getting it? It was like 43%. I mean, that was probably yeah. millions of, of, of families. You know, I, I meet people all the time now. Like when I started Code for America back in 2010, I was definitely surprised at the time how many tech folks wanted to work in government. Like everyone, I, I would tell people, I'm going to start this program. They'd be like, no one's going to apply for that. Tech people don't want to work in government. But we had 525 people for 20 slots the first year. But now, like, it's even more people. And I think because they've had a chance to see how much impact you can have, whether it's COVID response or, you know, helping the U.S. government help Ukraine or SNAP benefits. Like once tech people get a taste of doing tech in government and and design people and and people not inside tech, most of the time they're hooked because the impact is so huge. And it's, it's, it's it's a big misunderstanding that people think that tech people don't want to go into government. In fact, what we really need is government to get better at hiring processes so yep. we can hire and onboard these people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of techies would happily join if they uh, could be onboarded quickly and utilized effectively. I think that's a lot of the, the, a lot of the concern. So the U.S. Digital Service, USDS, has been a major success story and has already paid for itself uh, something like 20-fold. Can you update us on what's going on with this uh, crack squad of techies who hang out in DC and try and uh, get stuff done. Like, what what's it up to? When did it get started? I actually uh, write about the USDS and in, in forward because I admire it so much. It, it's a great institution. Um, uh, it's this modeled after the government digital service in the UK, um, though you know it's it's different in many ways because we're two different governments with different sets of authorities and structures. Um, so now it's a couple hundred folks. It's within the Office of Management and Budget. Um, I could talk a little bit about the challenges of getting it set up, but you know where it is today, I think it is best actually um, when it's helping agencies do their work better. So it's not really set up to do things for agencies because that's only going to help in the very short term. And in fact, this is in its DNA. Like I was at the White House trying to set up USDS when healthcare.gov failed. And yes, um, my boss brought in a team that helped CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, get the site back up. But a lot of the end of the book is really the story of the aftermath of that. I guess aftermath sounds like a bad word, but I mean the good aftermath of that in which CMS really realizes that this approach that um, Todd Park and others brought at that time, this user-centered, agile development, um, that they could do it themselves. And the transformation that CMS has been going through to be a fantastic leader in agile and and a fantastic service provider um, and the real successes that they've had since then which don't rely on the USDS anymore. They do it themselves. And I think that's true at the VA. It's true all over HHS. It's been true um, in many departments. Uh, It's true at USCIS, Citizenship and Immigration Services. And some of their projects aren't even things like service delivery, you know, um, the refugee program or um, the uh, VA healthcare but they are the core functions that government needs to do. So, for instance, uh, there's login.gov. Like, every agency can use this tool. It's actually, you know, a, a project of GSA, but was started as a collaboration between GSA and USDS. And then there's things like hiring, which I mentioned is such a big problem. Well, for about four years now, USDS has been working with the Office of Personnel Management on a project called SMEQA. Please uh, forgive me for that acronym. Uh, not, not my fault, but still um, <laughs> still something. I, I, great project with not a great name, but it stands for Subject Matter Expert Qualifying Assessments, um, which is basically designed to tackle the problem that, A, hiring takes way too long, but also that we don't actually assess people for their skills. 90% of open to the public job announcements in government rely on a self-assessment and a resume review. I don't know about that one. (laughs) Yeah, so Sneakwa is designed to say, no, we can do this. If, If I'm hiring a programmer, that we need to 
assess those candidates based on actual, uh, you know, assessments by real programmers. If it's, you know, yeah. and they've created a process that allows that to happen under existing law, policy, and regulation. We get far better candidates um, and we hire the right person and we hire them much faster. And that, you know, you wouldn't think USDS as digital in the name would be working on things like hiring, but their process redesign skills are amazing. Their ability to do what we call bureaucracy hacking is amazing. Their ability to partner with places like OPM is amazing. And it's they're really well used when they work on stuff that's going to touch every single agency. Like every digital leader I know in government says hiring is their biggest problem. And Great SMEQA process. is one way to fix that. So I, I think they're just really great when they're a support mechanism for making all of government better, but through the agencies and the agencies can take credit for it and take pride in that work. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. If you're a regular listener, you know that I am a mattress guy and that I believe investing in your mattress is one of the smartest, savviest things you can do to be happier, healthier, more energized, more able to live your life. It's why I'm so pumped to recommend Helix Sleep because they are the mattress company that will send a customized mattress to you based upon your sleep preferences, risk-free, made in the USA, Number one mattress picked by GQ and Wired Magazine. And there is a special sale for Labor Day. The best discount I have ever seen them offer. 25% off. That's right. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners in honor of Labor Day. Probably because a lot of you are moving. Need a mattress. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang and use code helixpartner25. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Yeah, so I think you should give rise to a movement, Jennifer. I'm going to give you a terrible acronym for it right now. It's uh, MAGWA, which is Make Government Work Again. <laughs> you can take or leave that. It's totally fine. Um, but I, I, here, here's my, my big question for you. So I, I'm a huge believer in uh, what you've laid out in this book. I think there's a desperate need to recode America and make it so that we're actually modern. Um, you talk about how, look, investing in 21st century state capacity is not something that uh, there is any political incentive around. Uh, meanwhile, I think that this is the definition of where we need to go as quickly as possible because the problems are getting worse and hairier, institutional trust is getting lower and lower. And so the only way to turn it around is to be like, look guys, we will actually deliver for you. We will be you know, accountable and transparent to you, really, genuinely. Um, so let's imagine uh, that I was president of the United States uh, mm -hmm. and you, and like you that. were, and, and you were to come in and say, okay, Andrew, here are like the three things that we need to do. That's going to make agile software development more normal, clear up some of the crazy thickets of rules and regs so that a group gets defined nine different ways, uh, in, in, in the, uh, legal code, which thus makes building a, you know, website for it impossible, uh, because one of the things that you said that I, I that struck me as true, having met with, uh, you know, I guess the first two CTOs, um, which is like the CTOs of the U.S. laid out really intelligent policies, but then those intelligent policies didn't necessarily get adopted by all the other agency heads. Because guess what, <laughs> you know, like, like if, if you're another agency head, you're like, well, like what's this, you know, the the CTOs like a peer of mine over there, like it's not, you know, he's like two or three levels removed from the president, which sounds senior, but then I'm only one level removed from the president. So <laughs> I don't really need to listen to it necessarily. By the way, not only did I, I run for president, I also even said down the stretch, I was like, look, I think there should be a new secretary of technology. Uh, and I think that you should just make a cabinet agency. And I hinted not so subtly that I was like, and if this were to exist, you know, like I, I'd be game for the job, though I, I dare say um, you'd be a better fit for it than me. But I was willing to to actually say, like, look, I would do this thing, in part because I, I was concerned about AI and thought that 
uh, someone would need to yeah. get out there and uh, and and actually try and interface with the the, the AI companies um, in, in a way that was uh, more nimble and um, up to date, as opposed to sort of wait for it to churn through agencies. Anyway. Um, You're so, still needed, Andrew. <laughs> well, 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 thanks, Jennifer. You too. Um, so, but but the, so I I now am a huge believer in Magua <laughs> or the the rise of the mechanicals <laughs> or whatever we're going to call this thing. Um, but uh, and, and you end the book with something of an earnest call, being like, look, like part of this stuff is actually getting in there, uh, applying your energies. There are a lot of heroes within these bureauc- bureaucracies and organizations. Like we have to kind of free them to be able to. To, to do the right thing. Um, uh, but it did get my mind racing to, okay, let's say that I was uh, ex- actually in that seat. Like, how could we clear the path for people to be able to do the right thing? You mean to go into government? Or, or like, yeah. if it's because one of the things that I totally agree with you on is that we have this Byzantine crazy layer of code, legal code, that we just keep okay. adding things to. Uh, and yeah. then, and you say, look, even if I were to transpose this into the cloud, it's still a mess. Like I just took like right. a, <laughs> like a bail of, um, what it made me think of is like extension cords you find in a drawer. It's like you open yeah. it and you find <laughs> extension cords and you're like, Hey, I want to take this to the cloud. It's like, well, it still looks like a freaking extension cord ball. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think we kind of need to start moving the Overton window, so to speak, um, you know, you think it take unemployment insurance, for example, like there was some talk during the pandemic of maybe we need to federalize this program, which is one, you know, one sort of major shock to the system that could change things. But, you know, I, what I didn't hear was we need to dramatically simplify this. I mean, really, how hard is it? Right. Like we're going to create some eligibility rules and then some benefit rules <laughs> and there's got to be some rules for adjudication, but it's not. 25 years of learning that, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be so complicated. It takes 25 years to learn. Um, I think there are places where we need to be able to say, we have to zero base this program. Like, let's go throw it all out and design a program that would work for 2024 and 2025. We never even say that. It's just like not in the realm of possibility. Um, I think a lot of what we need to do is just in a weird way, kind of when we work in government, we get trained to ask for very little because it's so hard to get even the tiniest thing done. Like, oh, I made a hire this year. I'm really proud of myself. And we need to ask for more. But like we as the public need to ask for more on behalf of public servants. And by more, I mean bolder things like let's just start over with unemployment insurance. How should it work? Can it be federal? You know, can it be administered by the states? Does it need to be federalized? Um, and I think that's just true of a lot of things. And, in, and until we put that out as a possibility, we're not going to get anywhere near it. I realize that it's a pipe dream with all no, of the- Maybe it's not a pipe dream. That's the point, Jennifer, is that we, we, yeah. have, to, we, we have to get this stuff on the table. Uh, and, and, when, and when I was running for president, I was like, look, guys, you know, like, I just want to make something that would actually help you and- it, and has as little administration as possible in the form of like universality, like screw it. And then people look at that and be like, hey, is that a pipe dream? I'd be like, well, shoot, <laughs> you know, like I mean, we'd have to make a move like that at some point because trying to push things through the thicket. And then during COVID, when uh, we started sending our relief checks to people, we did use the IRS. It was a highly, highly imperfect because the IRS, uh, it was not designed for that. Um, but still, uh, you know, tens, even hundreds of millions of Americans got checks or transfers. And then I got to tell you, my phone is ringing off the hook for like the entire month. And, uh, mm-hmm. and anytime I went out on the street, people would thank me, even though I, you know, like, I mean, I, I did lobby for it and I did hire lobbyists to lobby for, <laughs> for it. So I guess I maybe like I did deserve the thank you a little bit, but, um, but there were, but there were folks that, you know, thought that, you know, like I, I'd, I'd essentially, uh, like pushed that idea, so when you say it's a pipe dream, like I think it's the mm-hmm. pipe dream that we need to put out there is like we should just say like how can we simplify these programs to make them easy and delightful? And, and right now they're they're so punitive where it's like it, it seems like essentially I'm going to treat you like a criminal to make sure that you don't get any extra money <laughs> right. out, out of this program. I mean, you, you told terrible stories about like the 212 question application for uh, I mm-hmm. think it was food, food stamps or yeah. 
or or the example where you get asked whether you own a burial plot uh, in your mm-hmm. application for benefits because a burial plot's an asset. It turns out it it is worth money. And then you wound up sitting across the table from the guy who's like, oh, yeah, I wrote that because they, they Congress wanted to know <laughs> what your assets were and a burial <laughs> plot's an asset. Meanwhile, the, like two of us are just like, that is absolutely in- insane. Like if you happen to own a burial plot, <laughs> you know, like who cares in so far as your eligibility for – you know, for, for food stamps is concerned. Yeah, but that was a really, lear- you know, interesting learning moment for me, realizing that the guy who had put that in there, which I thought was like really punitive, he was just trying to do a good job. Like he just thought that, you know, his job was to assess all the assets, you know, and he, and that's what Congress asked him to do. So he wanted to be as thorough as possible. And it was wow, like the extra credit you know, is like the, the nerd. Extra, and I was a nerd. Yeah, I, I got them all. <laughs> I got them all. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, to, the, to that point, though, about like, you know, it's a pipe dream or not, you know, I tell the story in the book in the sort of the beginning and the very end about automatic records clearance. So you have typically a felony for marijuana. Marijuana is no longer a crime in your state. So the felony should be expunged. But there was a year long, incredibly burdensome complicated paperwork and showing up in court process that, you know, you had to go through. So nobody got through it. I mean, literally almost nobody was getting through it. And, you know, we were, we kept looking at ways to streamline the, that process to make it easier. But there were a couple advocates out there saying there shouldn't be a process at all and make it automatic. And a lot of other people saying, oh, that's a pipe dream. That'll never happen. It can't be automatic. And then we, you know, went and worked with the uh, the district attorney in San Francisco, George Gascon, and his his chief, um, Christine uh, Soto de Berry. And we're like, wait, we can. These are just records in a database. Let's just use an algorithm, very simple algorithm, to find all the eligible records, and then clear them all at once. And something that had seemed like a pipe dream was now a reality. And now tons of states are doing this automatic records clearance. And it's a great example of zero basing. It's not like, how do we adjust a little on the margins, but how How do we we make this crap a little less crappy? It's like, no, you know, fundamentally rethink it (laughs) and rethink it for a digital era. Like, yes, there needed to be a petition form back in the fifties when everything was on paper, but that's gym- simply unnecessary at all today. Yes. Why do it? <laughs> Zero base it. That sounds so so badass too, Jennifer. It's better than Magua or Rise of the Mechanicals. Zero, <laughs> Zero base it. Most of the times we're not doing that. And it is worth making it a little bit better every day. And I'm okay with that too. But I want to keep putting that, you know, that, that Magua vision uh, and this, that zero based vision and that sort of transformational oh, change out on the table. It, it needs to be there, Jennifer, because we're running out of time, honestly. I mean, like, yes. you know, we, we, we can't just keep on inching along. I mean, things are disintegrating around us really quick. Um, I'm going to close on something that I thought was really fascinating. And I thought, and this is like, again, why uh, I admire um, this book so, so much. So here's like the inchoate ideological argument people are having. Um, so, so number one is that like conservatives are like, Hey, government doesn't work. Starve it, starve it. Um, uh, bad money, bad money. Um, and then you're like, well, you know, like that, that, that doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense in a lot of contexts, because, uh, if you try and do that, like sometimes you just end up like costing yourself more money. Like you got rid of the office of technology assessment, which cost us like what, like you like tens of millions. And we probably lost tens of billions on <laughs> like, uh, and in um, even sensible procurement, as one example. And then on the other side, uh, Ezra Klein describes the liberal critique as a small, cramped, legalistic uh, professional, where it's just like rules, 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 rules will save us. And we're going to sue anyone who tries to do anything because that that's like the mechanism that we found to uh, to, to stop the bad guys or the bad guys are. But in, in some cases, the bad guys, the government is trying to do something. And so then you're. <laughs> then, then your your ability to do something uh, goes out the window because uh, you'll just be subject to lawsuits. California is particularly guilty of this. The the thing that frustrates me so much right now, and your book like illustrates this over and over again, is like is the the dumbness of the conversations we have, which is you know what we need we need more money. You know what we need we need less money. It's like no no we just actually need shit that works. 
Like, you know, and if I spent 10% of what I'm spending now and get 85% of the value, like, I would be pumped. <laughs> you know, like, we're to be pumped. The problem is right now we're spending 100% and getting 10% of the value, and then we're, like, arguing and be like, you know why? You know why you're mad? It's like, we needed more money. It's like, did you really need more money? <laughs> you, probably, you probably didn't need more money. And the average American senses this. They're pissed off because they're like, you are not – using my money effectively. <laughs> I, I, I can sense that. And then that gives rise to like legitimate uh, anger. Um, so so the, the, the thing that I want to say Magua or Rise of the Mechanicals is it's like the actual true middle ground is like, you know, you, you, you don't necessarily want, I mean, like I can say like in some domains, you probably do want smaller government, but in, in some domains, you probably want government that just does its job better, <laughs> like, like actually delivers. And then on the, the, the liberal side, it's like, look, guys, like you can point at the rule book uh, like all day long. But if we can't get stuff done for people, what's the point? You know what I mean? Like, like you're using the, 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 the code as an excuse not to deliver. And then if, if someone does try and deliver, by the way, and this is the cage that we put the government employees in because they're like, oh, I can't do it because of rules. Right. They're stuck. They have this terrible accountability trap where they're they're judged by following the rules uh, but when following the rules doesn't get you the outcomes, then they, you know, everyone's mad about the, about the outcomes. But we've yes. got to remove that accountability trap. And we need a, a sort of philosophy of our government that's about removing those barriers, not just about passing new legislation. Like, I think after chips and infrastructure and IRA, like three gigantic bills passed if we had the right culture in government, all of D.C. would have been like, OK, everybody is now focused on implementation. That implementation means removing things, not adding them, like freeing us to get the thing done, not layering a bunch more rules on something so that it's be harder to get it done. But instead, we just sort of assume that implementation will happen and move on to you know new legislative fights or new policy yeah. fights. And it's like we just swallowed three elephants Let's digest them. <laughs> but we yeah, don't even no, think that way. I, I, I talk to people who are looking at, the, for example, the need to have a bunch of mechanics go out uh, to retrofit things for green energy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, look, like that's what the bill says. But then who are the humans who are actually going to go out and do the thing? <laughs> you know, and it's, it turns out we have a massive shortage of those humans. Uh, and so even if you put the incentives in place, like, is it going to magically get done? It's like... Probably not in a lot of these areas, to your point. And so um, so maybe some of our energy should be spent on actually implementing, to your point. Uh, and maybe that, I mean, again, I'm still going to be groping for our tagline here. Um, like, uh, implementation. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, like, that's probably not that catchy either. Uh, but your... We your... need to keep working on this because I'm still struggling for the tagline too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, watch Silo. See if you like the mechanicals thing. Uh, that, I mean, that, that that show is a big hit, and so like people might dig it. And it's got, by the way, this like incredible female protagonist that uh, you kind of remind me of. Um, oh. <laughs> which, which is uh, you, you see it and see if you like the comparison. Um, anyway, but we'll we'll work on this Magua uh, rise in the mechanicals movement. But it, it's genuinely what we need. Um, and I think we we need to go as fast as possible. Like you know, your your book uh sends the correct message which is like look guys we need to lean in we need to like work with the with the yadiras and the heroes within but i i am someone who's like i don't think we have a whole lot of time i agree i agree and we should just tell people quickly that in the book we talk about mechanicals because the british civil service makes this distinction between the intellectuals and the mechanicals and i think that's you know that's carried over into our government culture as well. So it's like, wh where are the mechanicals? Do they have a seat at the table and do we have enough of them? Where are the fucking mechanicals? Jennifer <laughs> Polka, Recoding America, Why Government is Failing in the Digital Age and How We Can Do Better. Perhaps the best policy book I have read this year. Uh, congratulations, my friend. And let's try and make your vision a reality. Rise of the mechanicals. Rise of the implementers. Rise of the mechanicals. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's been a delight to talk with you. 